to be really clear. You're, we're playing a team. I've, I've, I'm, I'm probably too candid and honest sometimes for some people, but let's let's just be really clear. We're getting ready to play three teams that have over the last four to five years ranked in the top seven to five in recruiting. All right, so you're playing the best recruits in the nation. And um, we're going to be there soon. And that doesn't mean you can't compete and doesn't mean you can't win the game and all of that. But there's a reason they're third in the nation in, on third down defense is they've got a bunch of five stars in the defensive line and the linebacker and at safety and at corner. I mean, they're really, really talented. And when you put on the film, you see that. I mean, they're, they're closing speeds incredible. Um, they're physical up front. And it's, uh, it's a tall, tall challenge for us in year one to, to you know, to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with A&M and Georgia next week and LSU the following week. That it's, uh, um, it's our goal to get there. But that's what reality is, is, is we have, we've had about eight months to recruit a half a class. And, you know, these others have been stacking it. And um, that's why they're ranked third in the country in third down defense is they're incredibly talented. Is Coach Free sandbagging us? Is he serious right now? Is he really laying down the, we're trying to get there in a few years, but we're not there yet? Is he really trying to say that right now in a Monday press conference to start a big game week that starts SEC play in your first year as head coach? I don't know, man. I don't know, but I appreciate the compliments. I don't know if we have five stars in the secondary. I don't know if we have five stars at linebacker. Definitely have some five stars at D-line, but we'll take the compliment. We'll run with it. And I got to say, I was pretty nervous about Auburn, and I still am. It's a big game, guys. It's a huge game. We're going into SEC play. Lost to Miami. It's a winnable game at home. Obviously, it's huge. We've talked about it a lot on the line. But I don't think anybody is as unsure of Auburn as its own fan base, some of the people that talk about the team, and now apparently the head coach. It's a team that I, after seeing them go 3-0, I thought that they were an improved team, ahead of schedule. But upon looking a little bit closer, you start to see a couple of cracks. Texas A&M is by no means a perfect team, though. A&M has to go out there, draw up a good defensive game plan, Keep building on the offensive stuff that they've started the year with. We're very excited about it. But Auburn looks very vulnerable when you really start to look at it, guys. Especially with some of the announcements this week of injuries to the secondary. Injuries to one of their best O-linemen that has apparently really affected their running game in the short time he's been out. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of opportunity for the Aggies this weekend, guys. So I want to talk about Auburn. Give you guys a little rundown about what to expect with them. And at the end, I'm going to talk about things we need to see from Texas A&M to rebound from a 2-1 and one start to the year that many of us thought should have been 3-0. and oh. So guys, let's get right into it. Texas A&M versus Auburn to start SEC play. But first, if you guys like this content, please consider subscribing. It helps me greatly. I'm trying to grow this thing. Bring more Aggies and other fan bases into the discussion. Talk trash. Give us your predictions on the game. And at the end of this video, I'm going to give you guys my score prediction and I'm thinking I'm going to get a little bold with it, so stay tuned for that. So as I said, upon further review of Auburn, there are definitely some cracks in the 3-0 armor that they have started the year with. But as I talk about those cracks, and as I mention the vulnerabilities on this team, that kind of adds the pressure, in my opinion, to Texas A&M, just looking at this game. A&M is in a must-win scenario here. You're talking about losing faith in a program if you go out and you lose a winnable home game versus Auburn to start your SEC slate after losing a game to Miami. You're talking about all hands on deck, backs against the wall, must win. So as I break down what I deem are many vulnerabilities to this Auburn team, keep that in mind. The pressure increases as you really look at this thing because I do think Auburn gives A&M some great opportunity personnel-wise still getting a coaching message in there as they have three new coordinators or two new coordinators and a new head coach. And there's just a lot to work with for Texas A&M right now. And of course, there's a lot the Ags have to work on, a lot of things that we need to see develop for this year to end up being successful. But we're going to talk about Auburn right now, talk about offense, talk about defense, new coaching, personnel. And at the end, we're going to talk more about the Aggies. So offensively, 
New offensive coordinator, Phil Montgomery, out of Tulsa, had a really good offense there. He was the head coach at Tulsa. He was also the offensive coordinator for RG3's Heisman year. He's, he's a veteran. He's done a lot. And it allows Hugh Freeze to take more of that CEO role that we're happy Jimbo's in right now instead of being involved in the down-to-down -down play calling. Uh, there's obviously some Hugh Freeze involvement in the scheme here. They like to spread it out. They like to play sideline to sideline, spread defenses out. It's a common philosophy these days. And Hugh Freeze loves to have a running quarterback. So it's a little bit surprising that they go out in the transfer portal and bring in Peyton Thorne, someone from Michigan State, someone who hasn't been known to be able to run the ball much, at least in his year as a starter at Michigan State. Apparently he was dealing with some injuries that year, and that's kind of why he hadn't run much against MSU. But Peyton Thorne is a dual threat quarterback. He was rated as such coming out of high school, apparently was dealing with injuries last year. And what they discovered in their recent game versus Samford is that they're best when he is running the ball. That kind of was uh, something that they seemed to, they feel like they unlocked versus Samford. And obviously, how much can you take out of those cupcake games? I mean, we do it. It's, it's your sample size and the small sample size sport that is college football. So you got to take a little bit out of things, but you also got to take it with a grain of salt. But they definitely started running the ball with him. Previously, in their first two games, they would run in backup quarterback Robbie Ashford, who was there last year, who is definitely more of a dual threat player, like a surefire runner, especially in red zone situations, give you that extra zone read option. They, they would run with him. I mean, and he's passed for touchdowns too. They can do a lot with Robbie Ashford. But what they did in their most recent game versus Sanford is they just leaned in to Peyton Thorne. They let him run, and he ran all over the field. He is currently Auburn's leading rusher at quarterback. But he is a high-risk, high-reward kind of a player. When the game's on the line and the big plays of the game, he is a little bit mistake prone. I've noticed as they get closer to the end zone, he will try to kind of force balls into areas. He gets a little bit aggressive. And I think that's what his problem is. He gets aggressive. He gets excited. He'll throw the ball into coverage. He's had a couple of picks because of that. In a big third down conversion situation versus Cal, he extended. He kind of dove forward, not securing the ball. And he fumbled on a big third down that could have been a conversion. And they ended up scooping and scoring on that play. That's kind of one of Auburn's biggest concerns about this offense is just the level of quarterback, what they're going to get from Peyton Thorne, kind of an inconsistent kind of a player within, uh, within one game. I mean, we saw it versus Samford, their first game. They started really slow, 17-0 in the first half, a couple of turnovers in that first half, and then he had the best half probably of his collegiate career in that second half. And, of course, inferior opponent, but you take, you take it as information. They bring in that backup, as I said, Robbie Ashford at times. I don't know if they're going to do that versus A&M because they discovered that Peyton, he's a runner. I mean, he, he looked very athletic and agile and efficient running the ball. So I don't know if we're going to see the two-quarterback system at all versus A&M. I would lean towards no, but expect that it's a possibility. They've been having some issues running between the tackles to start the year. Most of their good running plays have been coming on zone reads. Peyton Thorne, their leading rusher. Last year, they had Tank Bigsby. We all remember the kind of career he had. He ran a lot on A&M. And they had the backup Jaquez Hunter, who was looking really, really promising. But he's had a really, really slow start to the year. He missed the first game. Seems like he might be working through some things. Not as good as you might have hoped to start the year, as, as, as Auburn fans might have hoped to start the year. But they do have a really good stable of running backs. They have a lot of options there. A lot of ability to keep players fresh, much like A&M does with their running back room. I wouldn't be surprised if any of those guys end up looking pretty successful versus A&M if A&M isn't able to put a cap on their run game. Brian Batty out of UCF is a pretty explosive runner. He's someone to look out for. They have this other kid named Cod, Cobb who's pretty good. So just kind of pick your poison with the running back room. No true player has emerged as a go-to guy. Receivers, they have a really good tight end. A really big, rangy tight end that can get downfield. And he's one of Peyton Thorne's favorite targets right now. They have another really good rangy wide receiver in Shane Hooks, number 11. He hasn't been super involved with the offense yet, but he did score versus uh, Samford. He looks really, really big, and he looks like he has, he's a really good jump ball threat, which scares me with our secondary just a little bit. Between those two guys and their leading receiver in Fair, number 5, I believe, he's kind of a smaller guy. He's, he's just more of a great route runner, can get open. They have a pretty good receiver room. But the chemistry between them and Peyton Thorne is something that kind of holds them back just a little bit. Definitely don't have that thing humming yet. It's definitely a work in progress. When you have a transition year with your coaches, one coach, one coordinator, I mean, there's excitement. There can be years where it's a really, really successful year. But typically it takes a year for the message and terminology to come across. 
add that to both coordinators, the head coach and the quarterback, that's a lot to overcome. That's a lot of learning that has to happen, a lot of chemistry that has to be formed. And I think that's pretty evident when you watch this offense. But the upside is there. They've shown some really good moments. They had a really, really low scoring affair versus Cal. But at the end of the game in the clutch, they were able to turn it on offensively, score the touchdown they needed to win, get points on the board, and get out of there without the loss. That game reminded me a lot of Texas A&M at Colorado a couple years ago. Just an ugly game that kind of felt like a loss coming out of it. But you get the W on the board, so you get to live and fight on for another day. But really, really an ugly showing versus Cal. Their defense is, however, pretty stout. I'm kind of impressed with some of the names that have emerged. They have this linebacker. I think his name's Asante or something. He's a junior there. He hasn't really played before, but he had a breakout game versus Cal where he had like 12 tackles, a couple tackles for loss. This guy looks really stout, someone that can they can definitely utilize to get pressure on Connor Wigman. Their secondary is definitely the strength of their team, although it is getting more and more banged up as the weeks go on. I think they lost a corner for the year, or at least for several weeks, coming out of this last game versus Samford. So it'll be interesting to see how many young guys they have to play in that secondary. They look pretty solid up front. I would say comparable to how Miami looked up front. Um, it's not going to blow you away. They haven't been able to stack talent on talent with like a great recruiting coach because Brian Harson just kind of neglected recruiting for a while. But they have enough pieces. Number 50 on their D-line, he can get after it. And this Asante linebacker guy, he can get after it too. I predict that they're going to try to do a lot of exotic blitzing versus Texas A&M to make Connor Wigman feel uncomfortable. I don't think they're just going to rush for. They're going to blitz a lot. They're going to get creative with blitzes, as you should against a young, unproven quarterback. Although Connor seems to prove himself every week right now. He seems to be t making a statement on the year. At least that's how it started. But you know they're going to try to make him feel uncomfortable. I was reading up on their D coordinator, Ron Roberts. I think his name's Ron Roberts. I believe that's his name. Let me check my notes here. Yeah, Ron Roberts. I've heard that this guy is really, really good at disguising blitzes. That's kind of one of his strengths as a D coordinator. He's good at having those creepers come in from the, the corner spot, the nickel spot, the, the star spot. And that is something that the O-line struggled with versus Miami. So in a way, you're kind of glad A&M's offensive line struggled previously before seeing this kind of D coordinator attack because it's on film. It's been addressed because that's exactly what Miami's defense did. They were bringing in corner blitzes, bringing in slot blitzes, nickel blitzes, star blitzes, safety blitzes, getting really creative and kind of being sneaky with it. You hope this offensive line is able to identify that stuff because identifying the blitz has been, in my opinion, or identifying the twists, the blitz, all the stunts defensively, that's been the big weakness of this A&M offensive line. If they're able to go hat on hat, man on man, they do great. I have no issues with A&M's offensive line physically and matched man for man, but it's when they start twisting, when they throw the weird stunts, that's when A&M's offensive line struggles. So as we continue to say, A&M's offensive line will play a big, big role in determining this offense's overall success versus Auburn. But I believe there's enough opportunity out there, guys. I believe there's enough opportunity for Texas A&M to put up at least 30 points versus Auburn. So yeah, look out for the blitz, guys. It's going to come hot and fast. You know they're going to do it. You know it's going to happen. And let's see how some of these backups who are filling in for some of their secondary guys who might be banged up this weekend do. It could be a big game in the air for Texas A&M. I think, I think that's very much on the table. I think Connor has a really good chance to go out there. If he can perform under pressure, go out there and have another great game. Now, I am obviously more worried about Texas A&M's defense matching up with their offense. It's not a well-oiled machine by any means. But the upside is there if Peyton Thorne truly is a running dual threat quarterback versus an FPS level team. Because he did it versus Sanford. He didn't do it against Cal. So if he's able to run on A&M's defense and gash out these big gains, that's going to really scare me. Because then you open up the deep pass, you open up the deep threat, and they have some big targets out there in that really good route runner and fair. I mean, they have enough talent offensively to scare A&M's defense. And A&M's defense was obviously shaky against its only Power 5 test on the year. So I'm really looking at the matchups when it's Damani on the tight end, whether it's Jacoby Matthews on the tight end. Whoever covers that tight end has a hell of an assignment because he's huge, he has hands, he's athletic. And then that Hooks kid. I mean, look for him to potentially have a breakout game versus some shaky corners on Texas A&M. 
Those are two areas I'm really worried about. It's going to be huge once again to find a way to get pressure on the quarterback. You don't want this kid to get comfortable back there because as shaky as he's looked, if he has time, he's going to figure things out. He has talent. He's good enough, and he can definitely run. So with that, guys, I'm going to give you a score prediction on the game. Now, obviously, we're not really sure what A&M is yet. They've shown some really good things offensively. They've shown some big areas of concern defensively, especially with the defensive scheme they're attempting. Very much a sit back and watch things develop defensive scheme. Not very aggressive. So you really hope that kind of thing might work against Auburn. I think there's a good chance it does if they start running a lot of zone read stuff. I think A&M is able to score a lot on Auburn. I think A&M gets close to 40 points this game. I'm going to say A&M gets 38 and they're able to hold Auburn to 28. So I think A&M covers, unless this line keeps expanding. It started at like six, and now it's up to eight. But I think A&M covers. We feel good about the win. And if A&M's defense can hold them under 30, I mean, I think we feel good about winning most games when that's the case. So guys, what is your score prediction? What are things that worry you about Auburn? I think this is the kind of game where it's really about A&M. It's at home. A&M's backs are already against the wall early in the year. It's very much a must-win scenario for Jimbo and this coaching staff, and we know how this coaching staff seems to get up for these big games. Kyle Field's going to obviously be rocking, even though it's an 11 a.m. kickoff. I just know you know it is. You know it's never not, and it's the first game in SEC play. It's a huge game, guys. There is so much on the line right now. I'm really excited for it. So let me know any thoughts you have on the game, or if you agree with my score prediction or not. With that, I'll see you guys Wednesday with the call-in show. Feel free to call in. Give me your prediction on the game. Give me anything you're really worried about. Come on, invent. But guys, I'll see you then, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks, and giggle.